Okay, so it's just preparing the live stream right now and setting up our meeting for Facebook Live. Okay, so I think we're up. Okay. We are live. We'll give some people a few moments to kind of log in, sign on. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the live stream. This is Meryl with Akron Soul Train, and tonight I am joined by resident artist Aaron Foster to tour his show, We Should Be Home, currently on view in the Burton D. Morgan exhibition space in downtown Akron. The show will be up until December 18th, so there's still lots of time to see all this work in person. Our gallery hours are Wednesday through Saturday from 11 to 4 p.m. So if you can try to stop by because this work is really, really amazing in person, the scale, it's really great. Okay, Akron Soul Train is an artist residency program connecting and empowering the community and artists by granting fellowships that provide resources for all creative disciplines to foster a more vibrant Akron. Before we get going, I'd like to thank our sponsors for their continued support. The GAR Foundation, Akron Community Foundation, the Ohio Arts Council, Leaner Family Foundation, the Brennan Family Foundation, the Knight Foundation, the Char and Chuck Fowler Family Foundation, and the Corbin Foundation. Anyone viewing, please feel free to comment below with any questions um, we will get to them at the end, towards the end of the program, um, when we're done kind of walking around and I can kind of come back to my computer. Um, also, please comment on any of our videos, how you like this type of virtual programming, so we can continue to put out the most thoughtful and creative content for you all. Okay, I'm just going to get set up to grab my phone and we'll start the tour. Okay, Aaron, um, do you mind introducing yourself while I kind of get in position? <laughs> yeah, sure. Hi, Facebook world. Um, I'm Aaron Foster. Uh, I am, as Meryl has said, a resident artist. I'm super excited to be going through this tour with you all and I'm giving you a kind of inside clips of the show. Um, I'm an artist and educator now living here in Northeast Ohio. Um, I am originally from uh, Western Maryland, um, sort of uh, close to, but not super close to Frostburg, Maryland. Okay, so we're going to start in the beginning of the gallery. Aaron's work is in this first kind of part of our exhibition space. And so I'm going to start right here. Um, these two kind of smaller pieces, can you kind of talk about them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, these um, were from a series of works I was making kind of in the early part of the pandemic. Um, they were, I kind of thought of them as uh, like a sundowner series, which kind of has a, a dual meaning, I think, depending on kind of lens or frame. Um, my kind of thinking about these um, was that my also sort of like only respite, my family's only respite um, during that time, our only kind of um, escape from, uh, you know, kind of like, uh, we took the lockdown kind of seriously and tried to stay in as much as we could, but we would take evening walk and like kind of walks during dusk. And, you know, all of my work is about trying to kind of like identify with and understand the places that I, um, I where I find myself living. Um, and these are part of that. And so these were all sort of, you know, these exercises and thinking um, about just kind of um, the aesthetics of um, that moment, that place um, where I found myself and, um, you know, just kind of reflecting on that, that feeling, I think, for those yeah. pieces. Yeah, a lot of your work, and especially in this show, is about kind of uh, migration or, or where people find themselves, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, in the large, you know, my thinking about this show and, and all of the work in this show, you know, 
it kind of goes back to um, the kind of you know idea of knowing your place, um, and I and I say that in the kind of uh, literal sense, right? So I've been um, a person who, for about the last twenty years, has lived in multiple places, um, you know, pursuing opportunity, and all of them um, have asked me to kind of you know constantly kind of make new connections to places um, that I live. All of the work in this show um, is work that is based in or rooted in um, Ohio with the exception of like one piece. And, and, I, and that was included very purposely. Um, you know, I've lived in several different communities now since I've lived in um, Northeast Ohio. Majorly, I've lived in Kent. Um, I spent some time in Athens, uh, in Ohio, and then I uh, currently like, work um, in and out of Alliance, Ohio. And trying to kind of uh, understand um, these communities has been really important to me. Um, and trying to understand what's important to those communities has been really important to me. And the work, um, I think, reflects a lot of that. Okay, and then moving on to this piece, there's kind of a few pieces like this that are part of the same series that we'll go through. Can you kind of talk about the ideas behind this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, the sort of larger cyanotypes and the sort of wallborn piece all um, come out of my time in Athens. Um, when I was in Athens, um, I was really, really interested in um, kind of the history of the place. Uh, it had um, gone through like a lot of communities, I think in Ohio, um, periods of growth and, and sort of regeneration, but also sort of periods of um, kind of collapse and, and, and problems. And one of the sort of kind of crowning features of Athens is the Hawking River. Um, you know, if you look at the sort of layout of the university itself, which is where I was working at the time, it's been changed. Um, by the Hawking, but it also changed the course of the Hawking River. And so um, there's a lot of environmental issues in and around Athens that kind of create um, interesting kind of landscapes that are sort of both beautiful and sort of challenging, I think, in a sort of way. Um, the pieces are made in cyanotype, um, which I think is really interesting. I, I like it because um, like a lot of the things that I'm drawn to, it doesn't fit neatly into one kind of category. Um, it's both, you know, sort of um, print and photograph. It does a lot of things and it has a hard time fitting in, which is, I think something uh, as a person, I just kind of <laughs> relate to. I don't necessarily know where I fit an awful lot of the time, which is a lot of this. And um, so these pieces specifically focused on landscape around the Hawking. Um, the, rib, the ribbon of color, which is silk screen um, printed on top of them, actually uh, traces the kind of path of that river. So when they're like displayed, um, lined up, it actually makes sort of a almost topographical map of the river. And then each um, like scene or vignette behind it was taken um, directly from the land around that place. And what's sort of difficult to see in this work and many of the works is there's actually, um, I've been using for a couple of years now, um, overprint varnish, which is a sort of um, thick kind of gloss layer that's kind of difficult. And you can sort of see it in this image that Meryl's holding up now. Um, it, what's been printed over top of that are um, plant forms that kind of come again from, you know, sort of the landscape in and around there, some of them native, some of them invasive. Um, but again, it was just sort of this, I guess, layer and accumulation is something that's important to a lot of my work. Um, I really don't feel satisfied if it's just sort of a one-off. And so I try to find ways to kind of push the surface a little bit more. Um, and that's certainly true of these pieces. Yeah. That was actually going to be one of my questions, how you got that really almost transparent layer because the, it's very nuanced. I'll move over here, see if we can see some more. Um, so yes, thank you for explaining that. Yeah. For these cyanotypes, mm -hmm. the most cyanotypes that I've seen, people are exposing actual objects. Are yeah. you exposing photographs or negatives? Yeah, so I think it's a great question. I am. Um, 
working with photographic information. So a lot of like the work that I do lately, um, you know, I think like most people that are invested in printmaking, I started off really invested in drawing. Um, but over the years, I've become really, really interested in the relationship between print and photography. There's this really long standing connection between two. So a lot of the work now uses photographic content because um, I'm, you know, kind of really interested in the history and legacy of those things. And um, I do a lot of, uh, I wouldn't call it field re research in the kind of sense that I think a lot of scientists would consider field research, but I, I, a lot of the work starts with a camera and hiking. And so um, I go out, I document, I take lots and lots and lots of photographs, and then I sort of peel through them and figure out which uh, compositions are most interesting to me. Um, these particular works, uh, the negatives were, you know, or, you know, quite large. Um, and so I was using a large format inkjet printer to make them and then exposing them on an exposure unit um, that you would typically use for screen print. Um, it, it helps a lot, I think, kind of control your exposures. I, I love sun prints and I like the idea of working outside and in nature, but for the work that I've been making most recently, I, I'd like a little bit more um, control and, you know, being able to kind of dial those things in has been really helpful. Um, I continue to work at this scale, but uh, my access to large format printers has changed. So uh, recently I've been using a lot of baby oil negatives to kind of do the same thing. And it works quite well if you just adjust your kind of working practice some, so yeah. Okay. And yeah, that was like definitely one of my questions as to how how they were exposed yeah. to get, because it does look like a photograph right <laughs> okay we're gonna stay on this wall for now and move on to this piece which kind of um is in the same vein as the piece um on in the front of the show that was also kind of more red in tone yeah yeah i you know that um the kind of red orange you know pinkish kind of hue that i've been using uh, both of these works, again, um, taken from areas in and around Athens, um, you know, they were looking at uh, the idea of kind of like overdevelopment. So this one here that what's kind of hard to see and I intentionally pushed the halftone pattern much larger than I usually do in a lot of the work that I make with screen print in this way. Um, you know, very much on purpose because I wanted that kind of diffusion. Um, it's supposed to be kind of like a warning orange, right? You know, so sort of like evocative of, you know, kind of like a, an alert, right? Or, you know, something of that effect. And again, what's sort of screen printed over top of it. And it is a motif that I use in a lot of work for, you know, sort of um, symbolic of like um, housing development is this kind of like repeated tessellated house form that kind of breaks up the shapes. but. Um, you know, this one in that other piece both referenced, you know, kind of areas in Athens um, where uh, development was sort of really encroaching on the river some more, um, which, you know, has a pretty long standing history of, of flooding and causing, you know, problems. I think it was like in the early 20th century, there were actually multiple like, you know, kind of deaths and, you know, loss of life and property and things like that from flooding. So kind of continuing to push the envelope in terms of developing along the river seems counterintuitive, right? Um, from just a number of different vantage points, which I think all of these prints were kind of trying to deal with that idea, so. Okay, and then moving on to this first kind of larger grid piece. Yeah. We have, and this is also a cyanotype, correct? It is, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, again, I think this kind of grew out of, um, you know, pandemic times and adjusting to um, a new studio space, but also new opportunities. And again, you know, for a while now, um, you know, the, the kind of name of, the show at um, AST is We Should Be Home, and it's really more of um, 
kind of a statement than a question, or maybe it's a question and a statement, I'm not sure. Um, but it's all about this idea of, of figuring out where we fit in, where we belong, and, you know, um, kind of trying to connect to and make home out of the places that we occupy, rightfully or, you know, wrongfully or whatever have you. Um, this particular piece, um, a place between. So over the pandemic, um, my family and I, we really spent a lot of time um, in kind of like bogs and marshlands in Northeast Ohio. And I got really interested in the kind of um, history and kind of mythology of those places. I mean, um, the indigenous people that lived here had a really strong connection to those places and had some sort of really dense mythologies about them. Um, but then you can find examples of that kind of cross-culturally all over the place. So um, it was quite literally a place between in my thinking, right? So we, we would go to a lot of these vernal ponds, which, you know, it was weird, you know, we were surrounded by news of kind of, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of sad and challenging news that was coming out of the pandemic. And then these vernal ponds, especially in the spring, were so alive and full of sound, right? You know, they were just filled with frogs and life. Um, and they were really fascinating because they were both land and water. And so this particular piece was made, um, you know, with the benefit of, um, I was working with uh, Nicholas Arnold at, at the Blue House um, Gallery in Space down in Dayton, Ohio, for a show that I put on down, um, down at the Dayton Center of the Arts. Um, and um, I wanted to make something that kind of connected um, to those experiences and, and the thinking that I was doing at that time of like, I also personally felt like I was living in a place kind of between, right? So I was in between starting, leaving one job, starting another job, um, figuring out what it meant to be a teacher, <laughs> um, studio art teacher in the middle of, uh, you know, virtual instruction, um, just, you know, lots of kind of ambiguity. And I thought that it was really interesting to spend time in these places that were also, I think, permanently ambiguous. And I kind of took some comfort in that, I guess. Yeah. And then with um, the use of so much sanotype, you're kind of, you don't really have, I guess, as much control over the color of the work, but what does this kind of blue, this cyan kind of bring to it for right. you? Yeah, I mean, I think again, there's a lot of people um, who have said this I, much better than I, you know, and, and I think I'm just kind of quoting or paraphrasing those people, but I think cyanotype is this really interesting, again, kind of medium that rides uh, a line between, you know, photograph, print, um, you know, sort of has this kind of contemporary ethos of DIY, right? That like anybody can do it in any place and it's simple, but it's also, you know, kind of infused in a lot of uh, institutional documents, right? Um, and, but I think for me, um, I, I really love, uh, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, for better or for worse, I'm drawn to sort of melancholic things, right? And um, you can change that blue, you can get rid of it completely. And, you know, I, you can do things with tannins and just all sorts of really interesting things. Um, and some of those chemicals, you know, can kind of create a real wide range of color for me. And I, I'm really interested in those things eventually, but I'm still really hung up on the blue right now. Because again, I think um, emotionally, it just feels sort of in between. Um, and I, you know, and I think, I know I'm maybe over beating that drum, but that's kind of <laughs> where I am right now. I feel sort of stuck uh, in between an awful lot. I'm just trying to figure out where things are going. You know. Yeah, I completely understand that. Cause I was just thinking like the cyan, it's this brighter, more lively blue, but it it does really quiet the scene. You were saying that this bog had so much life, right? but with the cyanotype, it's very quiet. It's very still, yeah. like serene. And I think that the color really does have a lot to do with it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It, it has okay. a unifying quality to it too, right? So. Yes, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna turn all the way around. And we'll move on to this piece right here that takes up the entire wall. <laughs> yeah. 
Can you talk a little bit about uh, concepts behind this one? I'll go to up to the title in a minute. Yeah. Um, I mean, the title of it is, you know, while the earth remains. And I think, um, uh, how to, so I've talked about this before and I'll, I'll even talk about it a little bit more, but, um, you know, I, I grew up um, in a, you know, pretty religious household. Um, I personally am not, um, I mean, I still maintain kind of relationships to those ideas, but I personally am not, um, super practicing uh, in, in the contemporary moment, but uh, something that always stuck out to me about, um, you know, I was raised in a very like Judeo-Christian household and something I liked about the Old Testament you know, specifically was there was a lot of like found poetry in that text and that specific line comes out of a passage in the Bible and it, you know, it's sort of talking, it's it's like God reasserting a promise and saying, you know, like you know, while the earth remains, these many blessings will kind of continue. But I think like it loaded in that statement it is also like an acknowledgement that the, that the earth won't always remain, right? Like, and it's not, it's like kind of the subtext of it. And I always kind of fixated on that and was always told, you know, oh, don't fixate on those, those aspects of it. But I think this particular piece, again, it was made in Athens while I was in Athens. Um, I'm really interested in like um, complicating images. You know, I think it's easy, especially with the proliferation of photographs, to like take them all in at once and then move on quickly. Whereas if I break them up or slow your read of them down a little bit, I feel like maybe I'm deluding myself, but I feel like you have to think about them more, if not for any other reason than to kind of like put them back together in your own mind. Um, this picture was taken, um, you know, in Athens over the river, at, you know, out moving out of Athens proper um, towards some of the communities that were still or had been invested in mining. And what it was explained to me, I think, was, you know, that there were these really lush, very beautiful like sunsets, but a lot of that related to pollution, right? So like the sky was, you know, kind of lit up in that way because there was a lot to refract off of, right? So the sky wasn't like, you know, that was the, the, the kind of caveat was that you were getting this beautiful thing for maybe not great reasons, right? And so I was really interested in that and getting people to kind of stop and think about that and think about, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, I think I, I kind of, you know, thinking about our relationship to the environment and, and what it means to kind of reframe um, that and take some responsibility for that um, and uh, acknowledge what's going on. And these are actually made of individual books that yeah. are right. hung down. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So you use the grid a lot and we'll kind of talk about that maybe a little bit more when we get to the large piece. Right. But with these books, like, they're individual objects that you've chosen to kind of show as a large scale unified piece. Can you maybe talk about like how, do you still view it as books or do you view it as a wall piece? Yeah, I, I think ultimately this particular thing, it's, it's a little of both. And again, I think that's kind of the point, right? Is that I mean, practically speaking, do I expect anyone to take each one down and, and enjoy it the way that you would a book? No. Um, so I've exploited the structure of the book without really maybe thinking about it as a book object, right? Um, but again, I think for me, this specific gesture, this is one I've kind of related to and then moved away from. Um, you know, it really came back to thinking about that title right? So like the while the earth remains. So there was sort of um, a scriptural relationship for me and thinking about like books, um, like scriptural texts, right? Like so large format scriptural texts. I mean, I was fortunate um, as a graduate student to have had um, the opportunity to like interact with a special collections library that was filled with lots of historical texts. And we had visiting artists that, you know, worked this way. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, I just, I was really thinking about um, the book as an object and then thinking about the image overall. So I think it's more about the overall image than it is the individual pieces. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Next, we have these pieces right here. And this is kind of also emphasizing your use of repetition. Yeah. For like this time in objects. And you have another piece that's kind of in the same vein. Yeah. So can you talk about how like, you know, you've chosen to install them, the use of repetition in your work in general, maybe? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, I would be um, a liar, I guess, if I didn't say that a lot of that interest in repetition, I, you know, maybe it's a chicken or egg relationship. I'm not sure which, but I think one of the benefits of being a printmaker is that you can make lots of something, right? Um, and certainly I've engaged with that in a kind of more conventional and traditional sense where I make an addition of prints and then, you know, they are an addition of prints, but I, it, that also kind of lends itself sometimes to um, waste and excess and all sorts of like other things that I'm not super interested in. So starting to think about like what I could do with the multiple is something that's been going on for a while now and how um, this ability to make lots of the same thing can kind of lend itself to some of these like sort of installational kind of ideas or concepts has been really important to me. Um, you know, this particular piece, um, you know, maybe base, but also kind of, you know, a truism here is that, you know, it was thinking about like um, commodification of land. So, you know, uh, like I said, I, I currently live um, in, Kent, Ohio, and um, and you know I commute to Alliance, and I've been working. I was working on this piece when I was working on the show for um, Blue House, and um, one of the things I was watching is one of the places I really loved to go and kind of spend time. We have a bog, you know, the Kent bog, I guess is what they call it. Um, you know, and <laughs> I really love the place, but they're developing the land like very, very, very close to it, right? And it had been this kind of like fieldscape. And so thinking about, you know, um, I grew up like, and this might, this is tangential, but I, I think related. Um, I think something that was really important to me was kind of realizing how complicated land usage and rights and um, development are. Um, I grew up uh, in Western Maryland and a community called Ringgold, uh, Maryland, and um, very, very small place. Um, and the closest um, towns to us were also fairly small, but they were getting kind of, uh, when I had left home, um, those areas had started to become kind of bedroom communities for larger communities or, around. And I remember coming home and kind of kvetching um, to my, you know, dad about, you know, well, look, they're changing the place and they're overdeveloping it. It's losing some of its character. And, you know, and his point was, well, there's some trade-offs here because people have to live and people have to eat and people have to work. So I recognize that not all development is bad and some is good and everything else. But in this particular case, um, you know, the milk cartons were supposed to reference kind of like, you know, the way that we use milk cartons to advertise um, or, you know, sort of announce or, you know, sort of circulate you know, the idea that a person is missing. Um, these are all like, um, you know, based on the same like kind of like square piece of land um, that's I snuck in there and took a bunch of photographs of like that area that's being developed. Um, you know, and it's meant to kind of, you know, kind of reference that. And then I think the lineup, um, you know, again, with the melancholy and kind of macabre thing, um, you know, it's supposed to feel somewhat, you know, grave-like or, you know, kind of repetitious in that way. Ah, okay. I totally understand that now. I got the milk cartons and how lands could be lost. Yeah. But I, I like the idea of almost the grave type usage okay and then we're gonna move on to this piece which is kind of both sculpture and that installed repetitious re repetitious image this is really interesting in how you've installed it even using both the wall and the floor yeah. 
So. Yeah, um, you know, so this piece um, relates actually to uh, the larger gridded cyanotype type that we were um, looking at just a minute ago. Um, the both were made at or around the same time and um, both kind of reference the same terrain. Um, and I think it's great that you kind of pointed out how, you know, the kind of energy, if you want, of the cyanotype is more um, still or calm or quiet. Uh, and this one, I think, is more uh, kind of representative of um, the energy or sort of like chaos of the place, right? You know, that like, I guess um, there's, you know, this sphagnum moss that kind of grows there. And there's these sort of, you know, um, just really interesting um, kind of plant life um, that grows there. Um, and it really, I think, you know, made me kind of think of, um, you know, gifts or presents, right? <laughs> Which is what you know, the packaging kind of, you know, there was always like a surprise kind of around every little like turn in the place. And it was really rewarding just to kind of like hang out there and notice how much you didn't notice the first time you went there. Um, in this sort of installation, again, I mean, it, going back, I know, I, I hope uh, <laughs> the Facebook world isn't getting bored with me saying this, but, you know, it's, it's again about that um, finding, you know, interest in things that don't, you know, kind of comfortably occupy any one given space. So this was designed to kind of occupy both um, ceiling or, you know, excuse me, wall and floor and um, maybe kind of bridge those two things that I, you know, I think it's becoming, it's been for probably a, a while now, very common for that to be a part of installation, but it's one that I, I haven't exhausted my own interest in. No, I like how, because it really changes how you even have to approach the piece, how you look at it, and is almost reminiscent of the bog, how you would interact, like move around, how you have to kind of watch what you're stepping on, what you're <laughs> stepping around. Yeah. Okay. Then we have a couple more pieces here, some large scale pieces. Yeah. And these ones are very new, correct? They are. They were, um, they were made explicitly, you know, for this show. And in fact, there's it's difficult to talk about work that's not present, but there's, uh, you know, there was a series of works made here. And I, I think um, if you don't, if it, I don't, if it would be okay to kind of connect this one to the, um, that other one, yeah. Um, because they are connected both in, in thought and practice, I think. Um, I mean, there are individual works, but, you know, for this particular show, um, one of the things that, I, I've kind of been interested in as a person who identifies um, with Appalachian as a sort of Appalachian, right? Um, and I know I'm saying that wrong to Southern Appalachians, but um, that's not how I was raised to say it. And I feel like it would be disingenuous for me to say it otherwise. Um, you know, is one of, one of the things that's been interesting to me um, having left Appalachia when I did is that no matter where I go, I find Appalachia. Um, and I, it, it hasn't mattered. I've lived in North Carolina, um, in, in the coastal parts of North Carolina. I've lived in Washington, DC. I've lived in California. I've lived just you know, all over um, really at this point. And everywhere I go, I find pockets of people or pieces of history that um, take me right back to Appalachia. And that was really true of Akron as well. Um, I was really, really, really fascinated um, when I started to kind of like look into it and find out, um, you know, how deep that kind of relationship was. And, and it's a story, right? Like any story, it has, um, you know, kind of heroes and villains. And I don't mean to valorize every person that, you know, moved here. And I don't mean to demonize anyone. I think what was interesting to me about that story is um, how it evolved, right? You know, and so, you know, if you look at um, the relationship between Akron and Appalachia, you can't remove um, things like Goodyear and, you know, these kind of bigger industrial hubs, right? 
Uh, and when you read, I mean, the, the real high water mark of this movement between Appalachia and Akron was in the like 20s and 30s and into the 40s to some extent or other. And, you know, the, the real kind of thing that's there is that, um, sadly, I think a lot of why Appalachians were brought um, to Akron initially was because they were seen, um, I mean, you know, just call it what it was, there was some kind of racism underlying the kind of intentional efforts to bring Appalachians in over other populations. But what that kind of ignored was how diverse Appalachia really was, right? So if you look at a place like Clinton, Maryland, right, where, you know, a large percentage of the people were actually from um, the Ukraine or, you know, Poland or wherever have you, right? They, they didn't represent the kind of breadstock um, American that people thought they were recruiting, right? But when the Appalachians first started coming to Akron, they had a hard time fitting in and a lot of them didn't stay um, or they had very seasonal kind of relationships. But part of what you read is this kind of idea that the only reason they came is because the place they left behind was sort of um, not great, right? And I think that's part of a lot of migration stories is we, we like to convince ourselves that the only reason people are coming or going to a certain place is because the place they're leaving wasn't good. And I wanted to kind of balance the two because Akron was also a very great place and a very positive place for so many. Um, and I think it was a really interesting conversation. And one of the things um, I looked at, you know, things online and some of the collect like special collections and archives, there was so much ephemera, both, you know, like recruiting posters and posters from, you know, Goodyear and different places. And I tried to kind of tap into some of that in, in some of this imagery, but also sort of provide this balance. And so the image on the left, the larger green gridded one is one of the few images in the show that actually isn't from Ohio, right? So it's actually from like um, a community um, very close to home um, where, you know, people may have come from. I don't you know, know that they did or not, but, you know, it's sort of trying to show that, um, that they were leaving something, that there was an exchange, right? Like that there wasn't, it wasn't just a, uh, I'm leaving, um, you know, for good. And it's, it's, it, I'm glad I'm leaving. It was sort of a, a, an exchange, right? And then um, the, the tire piece, which is kind of called run, run, run is meant to kind of, I think, hopefully kind of reference that feeling of constant motion, right? Like that you, you're not settled in a place and that you haven't maybe put down roots yet. And in connection with that, and what's very difficult to see on that piece in particular, um, one of the things I found, which is really interesting to me, was that a term that grew up um, in Ohio to refer to Appalachians, uh, initially it was kind of a pejorative term and then they, and a lot of people took ownership of it, which was a briar. Um, and uh, it, over top of these, again, in that sort of varnish, if you can kind of rake them up, you yeah. can kind of see the silhouette of thistles, right? Um, which was the closest thing to briar that I could think to work with and that I saw around me a lot. And so, you, you know, it's kind of repeated over top of those forms a lot as a sort of kind of, you know, I think quiet sort of assertion of like, you know, hey, look, um, these people were here and they were, they were doing their part to kind of help, um, you know, make some progress in Akron as well. That's such an amazing, like the connection to history and land and migration yeah. is, it's so rich. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you kind of talked about how your use of the grid or breaking up an image causes yeah. the viewer to kind of slow down their reading of it. Yeah. And I really liked how you talked about that. Um, you're also doing a lot with scale and kind of making smaller things build up into larger things. Can you maybe yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's something I've been doing for a long while now. I think it's both, um, kind of a, a bias or, you know, just an interest. And then also, um, it's born out of practicality, right? Like, so as a, you know, sometimes as a printmaker, um, the tools that you use kind of um, maybe set up some kind of creative restrictions or limitations, um, you know, and what you have access to. And I think I'm a real firm believer in kind of love the one you're with, 
right? Like um, if you have this limitation and you know you have it, um, figure out a way to make the most use out of it, you know, that you kind of can. Um, uh, as I had said, I think, you know, um, sort of job kind of flex, right? Like I, you know, moving from one studio to the next, to the next, you know, I was fortunate that I have um, a partner who is really um, supportive and we kind of did some talking and, you know, when the pandemic hit, there was a lot of like um, anxiety about how was like life and work going to continue. And so I spent part of my early pandemic building out a studio space in a less than optimal <laughs> kind of situation, right? You know, in this kind of like dark spider web uh, kind of covered uh, basement. But, um, you know, with the help of some friends and some things, I, and, you know, pooling some resources and, you know, taking some pennies we had scraped for a long time, um, I was able to cobble something together, but it is certainly not um, a large space by any means. And, and uh, I've been trying to find ways to kind of, you know, work kind of creatively with that limitation, but I'm also really interested in that kind of um, conceptual relationship to that. So like, you know, again, like I said, I, I grew up in a really, really small place. I mean, I think if you look at it, um, if you were to like look it up, um, it's technically coded a village, not even, we didn't even make it to city level, right? So, um, or town level for that matter. And um, I've always had this really, I think one of the strengths and weaknesses of those kind of places is that you really learn a lot about community and how lots of little parts come together to make a whole. Um, and that's something that I think just sort of nascently has crept into the work or crept into me and then made its way into the work. And so I just like this idea of, um, there's something fun and sort of magical about walking into a gallery space with a stack of what looks like, you know, 25 sheets of paper and then walking out, you know, leaving this like kind of larger statement on the wall, right? Um, versus, you know, I'm not, I'm not a real big adherent or at all an adherent of the go big or go home kind of mentality. But um, I do think sometimes like scale can be used to amplify um, things that are or maybe quiet and, and easy to overlook, right? And I think certainly in the sort of melee of what is kind of contemporary life, um, stopping to kind of really like appreciate the land around us um, sometimes isn't as much of a priority as we want it to be, um, unless it's like an Instagrammable moment or something and then, you know, <laughs> And then I think this view showcases really well kind of the use of color using the cooler colors for more contemplative pieces and then really activating work with yeah. kind of the brighter reds, the hotter colors. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, that was really intentional and really drawn a lot from, like I said, I think I spent a lot of time um, looking at ephemera. So like advertisements, um, old newspapers, um, even like farmer's almanacs and things like the um, distributive piece that I made that's on top of the pedestal there. Um, it's actually, uh, it's so, um, it says it's always good going, um, but it was actually like a bit of text taken from um, a 1930s um, Goodyear advert. And it, the rest of it was said like, it's always good going on Goodyear. Um, but um, I thought, you know, kind of like that little first bit really grabbed my attention because um, I think like the title, We Should Be Home, there's some sort of openness to the interpretation of that. Like, is it always good going? You know, I, I know growing up, um, you know, that was also it, you know, good going was, a, or it's always good going is a way of saying like, you know, things are fine, things are great, you know, it's, um, you know, good, but that can also be used in a kind of ironic, um, you know, sort of way. And so, and then on the back side of those, you know, is this sort of um, kind of lavender uh, landscape taken again from some of the landscapes around the, the region. And um, again, it was supposed to really kind of contrast the, the heat or the passion of, of moving, right? Because there is like sort of a lot of anxiety, or even if you're even if you're moving under 
the best of circumstances to get the new perfect job or do whatever, there's anxiety. But I think moving under ambiguous circumstances, there's some real anxiety, right? So that intensity is supposed to be kind of on the front and then the, the sort of um, sweetness of, of my memory or kind of the places that we hold on to um, on the back. And these are takeaways. So for our viewers, if you come to the gallery in person, you get to just take one of these away. And that has a lot of history kind of in the printmaking world and the pamphlet kind of world. Yeah. Um, kind of making these things that you can just hand out because, yeah. because you can. <laughs> <laughs> because you yeah. can, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like that's, um, you know, I think hmm, sometimes print gets this really like, strong reputation for being democratic but you know i think that's kind of questionable sometimes but i think it's in its best form it can be right it can be a, like a mm -hmm. thing that we freely give or help you know kind of share the 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 good news <laughs> <laughs> okay so i'm gonna make my way back to my computer show you guys one kind of last look um get your questions ready because i will be able to see them once i walk back to the desk I kind of get myself situated. Okay. Put the phone down. There we go. And I'm back. So I'm going to check the comments. So if you have any questions, please comment now. Let's see. Oh, yes. Um, I actually had a conversation with uh, Steven Tornero, who just uh, commented um, when we first started. He was asking about the overprint varnish that you use, kind of wondering how, how you did that layer, because yeah. it's so, like, it's, it's transparent. It's only seen in different lights and yeah. stuff. So. It kind of has this magical quality like when you see it you can see it and then you take a step away and you can't quite see it anymore yeah so yeah we had a whole conversation about that <laughs> like trying to decide how you did it yeah yeah so um, yeah. yeah the that overprint varnish i can't over uh emphasize uh the enjoyment i get out of it right like i just i like that idea of um you know, like subtlety and like the quiet kind of hard to find moments. And then when you do find them, I mean, I find those rewarding in life. So I figure, you know, I look for ways to kind of build that into the things that I make too. Then also just kind of having that layers on paper. Yeah. Um, as a printmaker myself, that's really satisfying for me. A hundred percent. I think that's one of the my favorite printmaker gimmicks, right? Like it's a good, good thing. And you're treating your paper sometimes, correct? Yeah, so I usually, I um, especially with the screen prints, like I've been using, um, you know, this isn't a paid advertisement, but I've been using French paper an awful lot lately, both because of its um, strength and its kind of affordability. But um, I find that, you know, it's kind of the, the type that I'm using has this like lack of tooth and I'm using water-based inks. And there's a tendency sometimes for them to not want to super adhere. Um, so I build up these kind of layers of, um, uh, you know, different varnishes and glosses and things like that to kind of really like give it some body. But that also really works with the things I want to do with it afterwards. And then um, the the run, run, run piece, the tire piece, that's actually uh, we pasted to the wall. And you yeah. said that that was the first time that you've kind of ever used that. Can you talk about maybe your decision yeah. making, a little bit of experience with that? Yeah, so at that scale, it was definitely the first time. I'd done like, you know, we've pasted small things or individual things and I'd tried out, you know, tested this. It was um, more challenging than I anticipated, I think, but it also taught me a lot about the behavior of paper that I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know or didn't anticipate, which was exciting, right? So like, um, you know, I you know, I think as we kind of talked about as I was working on it, right, you know, the, the weight of that French paper was 
um, heavier than I think the type of stock that normally gets wheat pasted, um, you know, certainly like more than I had used before. Um, and I think, you know, um, but what I love about it is the way that it evolved over time, right? Like when I left it, it looked one way. When I came back, it looked a different way. And I think that, that was kind of exciting. And I like the idea of this sort of, um, again, just organic kind of, you know, um, relationship between me and the things that I'm making, I guess. And if you're interested in learning more about wheat pasting from uh, Aaron, we are doing a virtual demo on November. The one thing that I didn't write down. Um, I think it's 20th. November 28th. I think that's right, yeah. Yes. So keep an eye on that for Facebook. Uh, there's an event up that has all the information. Um, but uh, yeah, now we're just printmakers nerding out about paper. <laughs> 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 that's true yeah. it's dangerous this is a very good thing to do right? yeah yeah okay so i think we can kind of go ahead and wrap it up um i'd like to thank aaron for joining me on this tour and for all of his wonderful insights and thanks to all of you for joining in the audience um we should be home we'll be up through december 18th also up in our capsule gallery and in the kind of back half of our main gallery space is Reshaping the Narrative, a show and film presented by the Akron Black Artists Guild. We will be doing a walkthrough with them, joined by the curators the, um, and the people that made this show happen um, to learn about the making of Reshaping the Narrative Wednesday, this Wednesday, at 7 p.m. also on Facebook Live. So you'll be able to catch that then. And it'll also be posted uh, afterwards. And that's a really amazing uh, show work. I think it's really important to the city of Akron. Um, and the film is really wonderful as well. So if you can come during the gallery hours and watch and view all of the work in person, it's really, really a wonderful experience. Um, yeah. um, and once again, and you can do that. Our gallery hours are 11 to 4 uh, on, from Wednesday through Saturday. Okay, so yeah, I think that's everything. Thank all you right. all so much for joining us. Bye. Thank you.